By request of the meeting organizer, recording started. Sorry about that technical difficulty. My name is Michael Hager. I'm the manager of technical Dis assistance and dissemination at the National Quality Center. And I'm really excited to bring you our March and Disparities Learning Exchange webinar entitled African American and Latina Women's Health. As you can see, we have um, quite a few um, folks helping us to present today. Um, and um, my friend and colleague, Nanette Bramagnani, is um, going to be co-facilitating with me. Um, so I'm going to move uh, to the next slide. As you can see, we've muted all the lines because we have quite a large group and we're going to be expecting um, more folks to join us. Uh, one of the things we like to do at the beginning of our webinars is get a sense who's joining us and from where they're joining us, uh, from, from, from where they're um, calling to join us. Um, so I'm going to start by entering some info in the chat room myself, Michael Hager, NQC, New York, New York, um, and disparities lead. And um, if you could just take a moment to enter that information in the chat room, that'll be really helpful. Um, it'll also give you a sense as participants um, where other folks are calling from. Um, it might be someone who you can pick up the phone later and dial um, or interact with otherwise um, through this journey of ending disparities. So while folks are entering information in uh, the chat room, um, I'm going to go ahead and um, Move to the next slide. Uh, we have a couple ground rules for participation. We want you to interact with each other in the chat room and to make good use of that. Um, you can also write questions. We have a number of folks who are going to be looking at the chat room to identify questions to bring out into the conversation um, as we're working our way through. Um, I've muted all the lines, and you can unmute your line at any time by pressing the orange button to the right of your name. Um, if you've dialed in um, another way and you don't see a button next to your name, look for the phone number in the guest list. And you can mute and unmute that phone number um, as another way to manage your mute status. We ask that you don't put us on a hold because while I have muted all the lines, um, many of us have some groovy on hold music that would be a distraction for folks as they're trying to um, log in and, and interact with us. Um, the call is being recorded for replay. Um, and it's going to be saved on our website by the end of the day today um, with all of our other webinar presentations. Um, and thanks for your patience with me as we had that technical difficulty with the recording at the beginning of the presentation. Now, looking at the guest list, I can see that my boss, Clemens Steinbach, is, is not on the line. It's because we have a number of things happening at the New York State Department of Health today, and he's at our um, Quality Advisory Committee. So um, on his behalf, I'd like to provide some words of welcome. Uh, the National Quality Center um, is really excited to bring this activity to the Ryan White HIV AIDS program community. Um, we uh, spent a year and a half putting it together. It was a lot of thought and energy that went into developing this program for all of you. And we have a huge number of folks who have been helping to make this a reality, including a technical working group and a planning group that um, calls on people from all around the country, from all backgrounds, and with all different types of experience and training um, to help us put this together. So we're really excited to have you today on the line with us as we explore our third full month of population focus. And um, if it wasn't clear from the title, this month we're focusing on African American Latina women. So. Thank you so much for all of your efforts and for your attention and for your dedication to helping achieve health equity for all living in the United States. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, um, our Learning Exchange is a nine-month initiative um, that is really okay. focused on improvement. And so uh, we're focusing on four populations that were identified in um, um, the former administration's HIV policy, um, which are um, uh, MSM of color, youth, uh, transgender folks, and um, African-American Latina women. And this webinar is just one of the many different educational opportunities we have to bring folks together to discuss these issues um, and disparities in care for these populations. Uh, this activity is just one of NQC's many activities that um, um, cover an entire range of services, um, from things that you can do by yourself at your desk, like the Quality Academy, or by reading one of our publications, um, all the way up to uh, participating one-on-one -on -one, um, in technical assistance with um, our coaches, um, or in participating in an event like this one today, which um, involves people from all over the country. So I want to take um, a moment just to cover what we're discussing today. Um, we're uh, uh, 
most of the way through our welcome and introductions right now, I see that folks are still entering um, their information in um, the chat room. Um, and hello to all my friends there who are doing that. Thank you. Um, we're going to move right into hearing about African American and Latina voices in healthcare um, by um, asking our spokespeople to share a little bit about their story and, and what some of their findings um, and what some of their sense um, is of uh, what's happening in the field. Um, we're going to then hear a little bit about what's happening in Broward County. Uh, they have a really exciting project um, that is uh, focused on um, women and uh, women's health. And we're also going to hear um, a, um, about uh, research and a project that's happening at Boston University um, as well. So, you know, we have the whole north-south um, connection here in terms of thinking about um, um, women and women's health and what we can do to help um, achieve health equity for all. Um, we'll wrap up by having some resource sharing and some back and forth among our participants on the line um, and then um, have some questions and answer. Our learning objectives today are to describe the ways in which the African American and Latina um, women communities um, are diverse, um, to list specific challenges that different women face regarding engagement in their own HIV care, and to name three solutions that consumers or providers can pursue to improve health outcomes for African American and Latina women living with HIV. So we're pretty concrete with what we're trying to accomplish here today. So um, that's enough from me. Um, I'd like now to turn it over to um, my friend and colleague, Nanette Bray-Mignani. Uh, Nanette has been working with uh, the National Quality Center and the Broader AIDS Institute for um, many years. And many of you in the field have probably come to know and appreciate the um, amazing technical support um, and assistance that comes from Nanette, um, either on a one-on-one -on -one basis or in one of our collaboratives or group learning activities. Dana also is very much involved in our um, technical assistance calls and is involved in other aspects of HIV programs that are brought to you by the Ryan White HIV AIDS program as well. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over uh, to Nanette, any, who can help uh, us to um, work through this conversation. Webinar. Okay. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, Michael, and to everybody who joined the call today. Um, how about if we have the next slide, please? Absolutely. So um, we're going to hear from Kanisha uh, Parkinson. Uh, she's been um, part of the H4C uh, Collaborative uh, from Missouri, and she's also a spokesperson for uh, this learning exchange. And Kanisha, maybe you could uh, relate to um, the people who are on the phone in terms of your own experience, um, and possibly if you could um, hit on different aspects of the care continuum from the time that you were initially diagnosed to maybe how you got linked to care either in a timely or untimely manner and um, what would you would say now about uh, your experience. So, Kanisha? Hi, this is Nishi Parkinson from St. Louis again. Thanks, Nanette, for the warm welcome. It was really appreciated. Um, I guess let me start from the beginning. Um, I was diagnosed in 1997. Um, in the summer of 1997, where I received uh, my diagnosis from a county health department in my town. Um, with that being said, um, going into care was very scary for me. Um, knowing what I know now and how things were in the early 90s, um, it has changed. The health continuum has changed. Um, it has improved, um, I could say that. Um, when I received my diagnosis, I received it on a Friday. Um, and I had to wait to Saturday morning to meet with the case manager. So um, my hope at that time was to um, really have someone cater to um, not overall my medical condition, but who I was as a person. And with that being said, the young woman by the name of Jessica Forsythe um, just really carried me under her wings um, back then. And, she allowed to um, spill over hope for my life um, along with my family because, you know, at this time uh, my family had to be notified. Uh, I didn't really want to walk that walk alone. Um, so what she did was work with me one-on-one -on -one and with my family to cultivate me in a way um, where I could live. And it wasn't easy. I, I would not say that it was easy at that time because I just didn't know how um, the clinic setting would be. Um, and if I would actually have a warm um, setting, you know, I was an adolescent at that time, and um, you know, adolescents have a lot to do. We we we're busy, 
um, we have things to, to see and do. So with that being said, um, her wealth of knowledge that she provided me during my journey um, spoke volumes. Um, because the role that I'm in today um, would have not been able to be reached um, for myself um, and my family overall um, if I had not had that aspect or um, person in my life to really uh, help me along the way. Um, what I can has improved. Can you, if, I could just make a, if I could just make a count, comment, I guess I don't know about for others on the phone, but you know, I'm really struck. Um, by the, the, the quality of the care um, that you got at a very early, both in terms of you were still an adolescent, but as well as it being in 1997. So it sounds like um, at that time that folks uh, helped you in the way that we continue to hope people um, will help those that are newly diagnosed. Um, would you say that's true or um, do you see any differences um, today? I do see differences today because stigma is still at the forefront of access. You know, a lot of people are fearful to come in um, to a healthcare facility or a testing site to actually um, know their um, HIV status. They still um, work off of myths. So what we have to do is work on removing the barriers of the myths 100% of the time. So with that being said, um, I can see a difference from 1997 to the early 2000s because the way we did things in, the 90, in 1997 um, was more, um, it was structured, but it was more in your face. And when I say it more in your face, it was that the people were involved more. It really wasn't on um, the numbers or, or data. Or, People cared. Not saying that people don't care today, but the care structure looked very different. I had, a, you know, I had another sister that I could look up to, or they invited me to come to a small group or talking about um, the issues at hand at a church or a neighborhood forum. Or, and you're meeting individuals 100% of the time that's walking the same walk with you that have been living with it a lot longer. I do miss that. I do miss that. Um, type of support 100% um, of the time um, to help people engage further in their own health care uh, needs. Wonderful. Um, it, it, are there any other suggestions that you see either there in Missouri or you've, you've learned elsewhere that you would suggest to those folks on the, fo on the phone as to how they might further support uh, young people? Um, the way for me to further support the youth aspect of the African American women population is um, to be open on, to have that personal um, testimonial, to reach that young woman or young male or um, anyone from any walk of life, LGBT community, you just have to have that open, warm spirit to accept the things that they're walking into because they're scared. Um, they, they don't know what to do, how to do it. Um, they feel that they're oblivious to the fact, and how did this happen to me? I did everything right, they probably thought, but how do I move on? How do I be accepted in my own population of adolescents? Because adolescents within itself have peer pressure of fitting in or being in the in crowd or if someone is going to talk about me, who knows? Do I look like I'm HIV positive just because I'm a young woman or a young male? Um, so they have stigma and they have um, barriers that they have to walk through to get to that point. But we as individuals and constituents around the table, we have to be readily and available to actively listen to what they have to say because they are valued as human beings and it's their responsibility to have their accountability piece for themselves to work with us and be empathetic and compassionate in the work that you do. So, Kanisha, there's there's a, a question also about how to help or support young people to achieve viral load suppression because we know that young people oftentimes um, might not be retained in care as as compared to other populations, or they might have um, higher uh, non-suppression rates. Could you uh, share with us what happened? in your own experience as a young person, how they helped you um, maintain your medication adherence, your appointments and suppression, and then maybe bring it forward to uh, maybe today? 
Um, back then I had a uh, physician by the name of Vicki Frazier. And Vicki worked with me to uh, learn about the medications. But for the first three weeks before I started the medication regimen, she did a jelly bean tool set up where I had jelly beans in a pill box form. And I had to go home every night and take these jelly beans for three weeks straight. I couldn't chew them. I had to swallow them whole. Um, the black ones were the worst. <laughs> um, but it actually cultivated my mindset to build a capacity around being compliant for medication. Hmm. Because I wasn't a person that always took medications 100% of the time. I'm, I'm used to liquid. I'm, a, I'm an adolescent. My mom always gave me liquid medication. So I was like, liquid is the best way we can go with this thing. She's like, no, you're going to have a pill form. No matter what, it's going to be a pill form. You won't do liquids, and this is what I need you to do for three weeks. If you miss a pill, leave the pill in the box, bring it into your medical appointment, and we'll talk about it. So she built a relationship with me um, around medication adherence. The tool Very that I use today um, with medication adherence is, you know, setting my alarm on my phone. Um, I walk with a pill container. It's a keychain container. Um, I leave myself mental notes around my home, you know, just to say, hey, did I take my medicine? Or if that note is not pulled down, uh, then it could be a possibility either I'm an hour before or right on target to take my medicine. So I put in tools to work with with my own lifestyle and what I do in the hustle and bustle of everyday life to manage my compliance 100% of the time. Uh, congratulations, Kenesha. Those are, those are some um, valuable lessons learned both for you as well as to be shared with others. And your initial provider was very creative uh, in how she was building your own um, empowerment, I guess, to be able to take your meds yourself. Correct. And the empowerment piece happens over a period of time because we got to remember, young people are not ready to have change. Change looks very murky for them, and they're scared, and they have this fear factor, and they build this wall up, and they say, I'm not going to do it. 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 So when you get an individual such as that, you have to really work with him or her and build that rapport and that relationship with her or him to uh, massage the moment of the, the fear factor. You have to reduce that barrier of fear with knowledge. Learning how viral loads are suppressed over a period of time, you have to talk with them about the CD4. You have to talk with them about the viral load. You have to talk about risk factors and being uh, virally suppressed and using condoms 100% of the time. So you have to have those working um, conversations over a period of time in order for them to lean into the knowledge base that you have to offer the individual. Thank you. Kenesha, I'd like to ask you one more question. This is about being a, uh, an African-American woman. How did you um, How did you cope with that at the time of being young, as well as kind of growing up with um, HIV and living in your community? How did you manage uh, both yourself as well as um, your social relationships? And um, was it difficult? Um, has stigma changed over the years? Uh, tell us a little bit about um, that. Well, you made an eyebrow raise because I'm sitting back thinking um, when I was diagnosed and I was young, uh, my sister actually um, was taking care of us at the time. My mother was um, in the hospital and she was unable to take her take care of us as siblings. And um, my sister really wanted to learn um, as much as she could about HIV. And um, we lost my aunt in the early 80s, Helena Hatch, um, which the clinic used to be named Helena Hatch Special Care Center for Women back in the early 90s. And with the movement of women now, um, and women need to know, those two concepts are still the same because women need to know was in the early 90s and women and women now is in the 20 you know in 2000. So with that being said, um, the concept is still the same, um, but for me it was a roller coaster ride because I came from corporate America um, and I worked and I lived with a substance abuse um, at that time and I was really in my mess. 
uh, when I was an adolescent. Um, in spite of the fact that, you know, I was still able to have those um, key events such as graduating from high school, but when I graduated from high school, I ultimately got the roughest stick thrown at me, uh, which literally hit me in the head was HIV being diagnosed. Um, took my life for a turn, you know, because I didn't know what was ahead. I didn't know how I was going to deal with it. I didn't know how people would uh, accept me as a woman living with HIV in my community because we're so conservative here in Missouri and people talk, you know. So with that stigma piece, you know, my sister was like, well, whenever you're ready to tell or whenever you're ready to talk to people, we'll be right there to support you, you know. And my dad and my mom and my brother, my sisters, they all um, supported me for when I was ready. Um, and I go back again and say Jessica Forsythe, um, Diane um, Bates, and Je Janice Evans, and Dana Williams, and Joan Ferguson, these are some key people um, that played an intricate part in my life, along with a young woman by the name of Rebecca Bathon. They really swaddled me as a young woman to cultivate me, to allow me to know that I can live. And these are the reason why I can live. They, they educated me. Um, they took me under their wings step by step, inch by inch. And they allowed me to process. And when I was angry, I was angry. You know, Jessica would come and make sure that I was okay and talk with me and walk with me. Even though I would continue to slam her door and say, I'm not coming to clinic, not today, you know, but she, she kept at me. She she worked with me and just told me that it would be okay. And eventually I believed that. I totally believed that. And for me being 20 years in, I'll be celebrating the 20 years of life, July 14th of 2017. I am so grateful for the wealth of knowledge that I received over a period of time in this 20 year uh, struggle uh, because I can't say that I want it all. Uh, I'm still learning, and I'm still learning from great people such as NQC, um, the Missouri Statewide Quality Management Team, and it has been phenomenal to, you know, help individuals become virally suppressed. We can't reach them all, but we can help as many as we can. We can still do this, and Mo can can, and Mo did. Awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. And we're grateful for, for you, Kanisha. Uh, so if there's any specific questions for Kanisha, do you want to put those in the uh, chat room? And um, Kanisha, we might be uh, getting back to you um, at, towards the end of the presentation. Michael, um, can we go to the next slide? Perfect. And, you know, Nanette, um, I'm kicking myself because you pointed out I forgot to send you the bios. So I did send you the bios now, but I'm very happy to read through them if, if that would be Why helpful Why don't you go you. right ahead? Okay, and sorry. Oh, I know, Dawn, personally, I would love for you to, to give a summary of her bio. Absolutely. So Dawn Trotter was diagnosed with HIV in 2007 and had a heart condition soon after, given a prognosis that she would likely uh, live for just one year. Her uncertainty about her health mobilized her to learn as much about it as possible and inspired her to share what she'd learned with others as overwhelmed as she had been. A mother of three, she has gone on uh, living far beyond that initial year and has served on the New York State AIDS Institute Consumer Advisory Board since 2014 and became the co-chair of the Peer Certification Board of New York State in 2016. Currently, Dawn works full-time at Evergreen Medical Group as a retention support analyst in Buffalo, New York, applying her passion to maintain HIV-positive people in healthcare and promoting their adherence toward viral suppression in her daily work. Welcome, Dawn, and thank you. Thank you for the great introduction, Michael, and thank you for having me. Absolutely. So, Dawn, um, how about if you think also, just as Kanisha did, is uh, some of the different aspects um, of the care continuum and, and give a, a, an overview, provide an overview for folks about your experience? Okay, so um, like Nishi said, uh, sort of have to start from the beginning. Um, when I became diagnosed with HIV in 2007, uh, you know, it was a shock to me also. Uh, I was in the beginning of trying to get my life together um, from being of active youth. Uh, so when I got the diagnosis, I was, you know, kind of lost. I didn't understand why this was happening to me. Uh, I didn't understand um, at that time I wasn't an IV drug user, so in my mind and uh, in my uh, culture, uh, it shouldn't be happening to me. At that time, I uh, was 
uh, you know, I, it shouldn't have happened to me in my mind. So for the first year of my diagnosis, you know, I kind of tried to kill myself twice. And luckily, uh, where I was going for my care at ECMC, I had a social worker, uh, Matthew Cray Higgins, who kind of just grabbed on to me and uh, refused to let me go. And he saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. And he, you know, he just continued to tell me that, you know, I was going to live. And along the way, I got the, uh, the heart, the congestive heart failure um, diagnosis. And I was told I was going to die within a year. So I figured, you know, all these things are happening to me. You know, there's no need for me to try to fight. But, you know, there came a point in time where I decided that I wanted to live more than I wanted to die. And I had children who told me they needed me to live. And so I decided that if I'm going to live, I need to learn as much as I possibly can uh, about this disease that I have and uh, how I can implement things into my life uh, that to help me live better and possibly help others. So I became very active on the peer um, advisory board at ECMC. Uh, I actually went to my first National Quality Center training uh, in Sacramento, California. Uh, on training consumers on quality. And actually, when I came back from there, I was on fire. I came back to my clinic and I said, listen, I'm a consumer, I have a voice, and these are things that you should be doing for me and for us, and I want what I want now and I need it. So, of course, you know, they were like, slow down, wait a minute. And I was like, no, you know, there's things that they said that we should have and things that you should let us be involved in. And we have a say, we have a voice in how we should be taken care of, and we should be getting this. So that all started my process um, of me becoming better educated on HIV uh, and just implementing myself into the setting to want to know more. And so I, you know, I started taking a lot of different trainings with the National Quality Center to get better educated. Um, I got on to the Consumer Advisory Board of the AIDS Institute, um, and I started becoming very active in my community. Um, as Nana said, I became part of New York Lynx. Uh, when I first became part of New York Lynx, I had no idea why I was there. I just thought, you know, I'm a positive person and I'm here with all these providers, but I have no idea what you're talking about, why am I here? When I came back again from that training in Sacramento, I knew why I was there. Um, and I actually started a program at UCMC called Panty Thoughts of Passioners. Uh, and then that had me do some data on uh, how many women, when I started the program, actually started coming in for care to get their past years that year that, that had not come the year before. So it was very good to see that data and see why the numbers are needed um, to continue to get grant funding and things of that nature uh, to continue the work that we do. So now today, uh, again, I work at Evergreen Medical Group as a retention support assistant, um, and so I'm a part of a program called RAP, which is a retention and adherence program, to just continue to make sure that people are uh, continuing to take uh, their medication, they're staying adherent, if they have any barriers, uh, I am there to help support them, see what we can do to um, get those barriers out the way if they have housing issues or if they just need support. Um, you know, I'm there as that support. You know, in my community, we don't talk about HIV. Um, you know, it is a, a, a thing that uh, in the Latino and even in the African American community that if you are HIV positive, you're either one, a drug user, IV drug user, or you must be gay. So for a woman to have it, it's like, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a big thing. So. Um, you know, I, I, I try to educate as many people as I can, and I, when I became part of this uh, disparity uh, campaign, I did it because I wanted to be the space that someone could recognize and say, you know what, she's like me, and if she can do it, um, if she can live through this, uh, I can do it too. Because, you know, sometimes we stigmatize ourselves more than anybody else can do. And yeah. as long as we hide, no one ever is going to come forward. So I want to educate. I want to share my story. I want to be that space that someone can say, you know what, look at her. That's not what I thought HIV looked like. 
um, in my in my community, and if she's willing to be that face, maybe I can go get care. Maybe I can make it through this. So, Dawn, I think that, that you have um, inspired many people, um, both by your own personal story of of coming through uh, and dealing and wrestling with your your um, your HIV diagnosis, but also then to um, be a consumer leader uh, in your community and through the state, as well as I'd like to open it up to uh, Kanisha too before we move on to the next presentation. There's a question about how, what other types of QI projects that consumers could either be involved in or be consumer led. So I'd like to uh, ask you, Dawn, and then ask. Uh, Kanisha to also comment because I know Missouri has has done some very innovative work around this. So uh, Dawn, do you want to take um, take a shot at that first? Well, fire consumer led quality products. I guess it's going to be different for every state and every clinic and every area. I know here in New York State um, we have a lot of peers that are very active in their clinics and in and in their areas. Um, like the peer certification program, our peers are now becoming certified to be certified uh, peers of you know, New York State so that they can go out and get peer jobs and clinics. Um, and then fire quality projects, um, I mean, again, it's going to depend on each clinic and how many consumers you have that are willing to step up to the plate to take on uh, these projects. You know, it could be something simple as the waiting room area, if you feel like uh, you know, you're sitting in the waiting room and, and, and maybe it's, there's not enough privacy settings or something. You know, maybe if you had a peer to do like a survey process of, you know, what would you change or do different, you know, to make this process go faster or where there's more privacy, uh, you know, blockages and things of that nature. But again, it just depends on how much activity uh, each clinic allow their peers because again, you know, I have to say this that when I first started at ECMC, I was the only peer um that actually was allowed behind the counter. And I had to fight for that right to be able to be behind the counter, not just as the patient, uh, but as a volunteer consumer peer. Um, and there was only a little bit of what they would allow me to do, but I kept pushing. I kept saying, you know, I can take the same uh, HIPAA regulations that you can, I'm still, you know, at the end of the day, I'm still a person before I'm a person who has HIV, so let's not stick me in this box. You know, I've worked, at, you know, I have two degrees, you know, I, I just want to be here to help. So again, it's going to depend on what each clinic allows and how many actually people each area has to step up to the plate. Uh, Dawn, I'm going to ask you, um, were you involved in uh, Evergreen uh, Medical Group's um, Healthcare Stories Project? Yes. Maybe okay. you could just highlight that a bit and then we'll, we'll um, ask Kanisha uh, to comment. So the Healthcare Stories was a quality project that was put together, and I believe this was by me, was it through New York Links, and I could be wrong. Um, and it was a three, I think it was four parts, um, and it was a quality management project, and each part had a different uh, uh, outcome that they were trying to get. So the first one that we did um, was we had our clients and our patients fill out surveys on with one word, how could they describe uh, what they felt when they came into the clinic. And after all of the, the surveys got back, we built this evergreen tree. I wish I had a picture of it. Uh, and it had all of the words that were used the most. Uh, and then the next part, I believe, was um, it was a uh, how does your visit go from when you walk in the door to when you hit the reception area to when you go into get your triage to when you see the doctor, to when you go get your blood draws, to when you leave out. And we did that like with smiley faces and things of that nature. And then we put all the data together to see how well or bad we were doing as a clinic. And then the next stage was um, what does a perfect visit look like? So there were different stages that myself and another peer was a part of um, the front desk the front desk 
uh, people were a part of it and uh, patients, uh, you know, uh, answer some of these, but a lot of it was done in survey form. Great, because I, I think there was a really wonderful example of peer engagement in um, working with peers that were coming in as patients um, and, mm -hmm. and finding out more about their experience. So, yeah. thank you. Um, You're welcome. Kanisha, would you like to make any comments? I see that you were sharing, I think, a share of stories. Well, no, I was just agreeing with Don uh, that saying that we need to uh, share our hero stories her, um, okay. all the time. I was just agreeing with her. Um, okay, are there any, um, you want to say anything about what you've done with MoCan and about consumer engagement or um, culturally sensitive um, environments for um, African American women and Latina women? Okay. Has anything all right. Over the last uh, 24 months, uh, we worked with um, the National Quality Center in MoCan, where we um, came up with um, a target project, which was viral load suppression, where we talked about trends over a period of time of how individuals can um, access medical visits, what's their barriers for medical visits, uh, why an individual is not becoming virally suppressed. So over the period of time, we wanted to get ourselves at 85% of um, patients being virally suppressed in several of our clinics. And from the consumer standpoint, um, the information that I would bring back to the providers is um, different barriers that the clients may have over a period of time. In our state of Missouri, um, St. Louis, Missouri, we have difficult barriers such as transportation, some of our clients don't have um, telephone services uh, readily and available, or they continue to use minute phones, so that becomes a barrier where we can uh, correlate or talk about the missed appointments that they've had over a period of time. Uh, we've also um, did the MAP experience uh, surveys at our WashU clinic, um, and most of our um, people really talked about um, their scheduled appointments. They were very happy with their scheduled appointments and um, receiving those reminder calls and reminder letters. Um, so that was very helpful information um, to have come back uh, to the team to, to know that the front office, the back office, the health coaches and the peers and the case managers are working really diligently to um, get the need met for each individual who may lack those barriers. Um, so it's like a win-win situation if we communicate in that way. Um, on the back end of that, I actually uh, am the vice co-chair of our community advisory board here for Part D for women, children, and youth and their families. And on that um, cab, we implement programs for women, children, youth, and their families. Um, we work together to enhance um, the quality of life of things that are happening in the community along with the things that are happening in the clinic setting. And we bring those uh, issues to the table and we talk about those over a quarterly period of time along with education where we may have an outside um, guest speaker that brings new information to us as what's happening, you know, in the world of HIV for its medication adherence. Um, side effects of those medications so that we can be able to be the champions in the community 100% of the time. Great. Thank you, uh, Kanisha. Um, and so if anybody has any more specific questions for Dawn and Kanisha, please um, type them into the um, chat room. And I'm going to hand this back to you, Michael, uh, to transition us to the next presentation. And thank you, Dawn and Kanisha. Thank you. Absolutely. You know, um, I see that, and Nanette did post that there's a webinar coming up um, on the Healthcare Stories Project right in the chat room. Um, you can email me, as she indicated, if you'd like an invitation or a direct link for that information, uh, for, for that presentation. Um, you'll see that I also put a couple of things in the chat room, too. The In Care Campaign um, actually had a webinar in early 2016 that looked at healthcare stories, um, a photo project, and other art projects that come from different parts of the country, including New York State. Um, Kansas City area, um, and um, Virginia. So a number of opportunities to kind of think about this in ways that we can involve art and expression as a way to address stigma and also to empower each other and to, to really build up our consumer community um, to support itself. So 
So um, um, our next presenter is um, Ariana Lint. Ariana is a refugee uh, Latina trans woman from Lima, Peru, founder and CEO of Ariana Center um, and uh, Trans Latina Florida. Her last job was the director of transgender advocacy for a South uh, Florida nonprofit before she started her own enterprises. Now her role is to help connect trans uh, residents with employment opportunity, uh, safe housing, social networks, and medical services. Um, educate, uh, education and professional training um, and motivational speaking are other activities that are um, core to her, um, her role. She served on the board uh, for uh, Trans Latin uh, Trans Latina Coalition, chair of the Community Empowerment uh, Committee of the HIV Broward Planning Council. She's part of the Trans Action Florida Group of Equality Florida and also recently became a member of the uh, Trans uh, T Plus National Advisory Board. Um, as part of the Transgender Law Center of San Francisco and Elton John Foundation as she uh, is the uh, Community Advisory Board and Spanish blogger for The Well Project. Um, originally from Peru, uh, where she lived through her graduation from law school at San Martin uh, de Porres University, um, Ariana is um, uh, providing consultation to CDC and the White House on HIV issues for uh, transgender individuals living in the United States. And um, she wants to um, stress that they don't just provide services, uh, they change lives. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Ariana for the next segment of our talk today. Ariana? And you're muted, and I've unmuted you. There you go. Okay, hello. Hello. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you so much for the great presentation. Oh my God, I don't know. I I, I did all of everything. What it was. But um, like a Latina transgender woman living with HIV in United States, in my first uh, slide is representing what is the um, the um, the 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 United States uh, looking for. Uh, look like for us, right, like American dream. Uh, but sadly, no everyone has complete access to those opportunities, especially Latinas women or Latinas um, trans women. I have uh, the opportunity to do, uh, somebody give me the, the opportunity to um, join a um, very, very good program over here. I'm right now in Orlando, Florida. Um, help me program part of the Department of Health, and they give me the opportunity to have a, a job, and then I develop in my career in the HIV, right, when I left my career in Peru. So I think uh, for many of, of immigrants, uh, the American dream is not just financial, but is uh, more of the different opportunities. These areas um, come in from many directions. Uh, like financial stability, specific in the transgender Latinas or trans Latinas, when we have uh, um, annual income of less uh, when seventy when fifty five percent of uh, transgender they living with an income of less of ten thousand dollars per year, right? Um, this is one of the um, new diagnosticers. The second the 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 next slide uh, estimate the new HIV diagnosis in the United States. Um, mm -hmm. And the most affected superpopulation. This is from 2014, and you can see the uh, um, Hispanic and Latino being the, in the third place. But also, you can see in the in the other place the Hispanic Latino woman. You know, and and for many Latinas, it's very um, important this this data. And for the next slide, we have in uh, like uh, in 2014, Hispanic Latinos accurated 20 uh, for, uh, for 20 percent of the estimate of the new uh, infection diagnosis, the new infections in the United States. Um, I'm living, I living right now in in South Florida area, where is the the first and the, and the second place of the new infections, Miami Dade and Broward area, and. Um, and many of them is Latinos, right? And, uh, and it's 86% 80, of the estimate HIV diagnostic is where it was like uh, by Hispanic woman, and we are attributed to the heterosexual contact, right? And uh, over here is one of uh, of the issues for the trans Latinos or the transgender 
the HIV where we don't have a data and maybe we are not in the correct place uh, because for the Latin, trans Latinas, they have a more, most uh, encounter or risk, uh, risk factor on encounter when a, a person they don't, they don't realize or they don't assume they are gay or, or, or bisexual. So there is especially for the Latino the Latino, Latino culture, right? And um, let's go to the next slide. And, um, and how, how we can have a prevention challenges for a number of the factors of the HIV epidemic in the Latino community, because let me, uh, I'm then going to the next slide, when it's uh, uh, one of the, uh, of the common for the, for the Latino community, right? The uh, high prevalence in HIV is in the Latino community, higher rate of sexual, uh, sexually transmitted disease, the STDs, is in our community of the Latinos, the prevalence in the Latinos area. Um, like, again, I'm from, I live in right now in Fort Lauderdale, where it's the most uh, affecting the fourth place in the nation about STDs. Um, cultural factors is very important because some clinics, they have uh, or, or some, uh, they don't have the Latinos um, um, testing or, or Latinos inclusion, right? And uh, or maybe one of the cultural factors is when I uh, like a, a client, how I can how I can interact with my um, HIV provider when the HIV provider don't have any analogies of the. Uh, uh, Latino on, on my language, how I can say I uh, have a pain somewhere when I don't know what is the part of my organ in, 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 in English, but I know in Spanish. So it's very important the cultural factors, the social factors, um, the poverty of the, of the community. One of the more important right now. Uh oh. Maybe afraid. Okay. Hello? Oh, hello. I thought we lost yeah. you for a second, Ariana. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, disclosing um, the immigration factor is very important uh, of the Latinos. And over here is uh, the next slide. We can see uh, a picture of and I put a transgender Latinas in eyes because like um, like a transgender living with HIV uh, and Latina, and I have the best treatment of, uh, uh, for my for my um, HIV treatment. Uh, what's going on if one, like a transgender, they take me in the detention. I take me in the detention center. Um, my face is sometimes um, be out of the care for a long time or, or period because they don't um, they don't know how is the analogy to um, uh, treat transgender or trans Latinas in the ICE detention center, and also in the Latino Latino community in the ICE detention center. Right. Um, that's why coming up and, uh, and my next slide is. Um, after I have um, the whole um, the whole credibility in my job, I'm tra I think for um, transgender Latinas or transgender in, in South Florida, I'm open my my center. What is a center? Um, engage, empower, and lift up the transgender community in South Florida area. Um, and we place a special emphasis in the most marginalized. Community and documented uh, people living with HIV and AIDS and those who have experience of cancellation. And for the Latina community, it's very important to have some terminologies. I put over the Latin X because it's more inclusive, but some person they call trans Latina, trans Latinas, or, 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 or Latina, or, or Latina woman. So it's, it's different words, but the Latinx is more inclusive. So that's what I put uh, the Latinx. And, um, and it's very important for the Latina woman, no matter what, um, um, what is your preference or how you, it's very important to get access uh, and have inclusion and open doors for the other Latinas around, right? Um, I'm, I'm over here right now in Orlando, uh, Florida, because we give training to the um, national meeting for the building leaders of color for transgender living when HIV. Uh, and also Orlando was my, uh, the play, Orlando, Florida was uh, in 2006, the place where um, I have a uh, uh, positive and also, um, help me in Orlando give me the opportunity to have a job 
uh, and be just a peer, but then I take the advantage of the interview peer and I make a career. And I'm very proud, I think, what I do, and, and I'm very proud about the connections and the network I have, and I learn for many amazing women around the United States or, or people like working together. I have a very nice experience, and that's what I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm transmitted to my community, the transgender or the trans Latinas community, right? But I think it's important to have the, um, the opportunity to have uh, the voice of the Latinas and the HIV is very important. Thank you so much for that presentation, uh, um, Ariana. And I, I'm so happy that you're with us today because I think that it's really important for us to think about African American Latina women as that's a large group of people. There's a lot of diversity there. And the trans experience, the immigrant experience, the multilingual experience, um, you know, all of the things that you touched on are really important for us to think about when we're serving women and women's health issues in terms of identifying where people have come from and, and, and where they're trying to go as individuals and, and, and thinking about these things to make sure that we're serving everyone that they, the ways that they need to be served and so that we can help everyone achieve um, health equity. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's any one or two specific things that you would recommend that folks in the line, um, you know, should consider when, when working with Latina population or um, women who are immigrants or um, um, trans women, any, any insight or, or suggestions for folks who work with these groups? Well, I think um, um, when those groups, uh, when those uh, agencies, they um, – open doors and give opportunity, not just a peer opportunity, but give opportunity like employer and, and management decision to a Latina woman um, 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 present experience living with HIV, I think is very important. Like I, um, not, um, especially when I have uh, when I have the position, the, my first position, and apply just for a peer because that is, uh, I I am a hundred percent sure they need a transgender peer, you know. So that's what I'm applying for the position. But also, everybody has a dreams, and everybody everybody ha have to uh, have the opportunity to 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 make a career and, 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 and have better quality of life. So I think like a Latina, no matter trans Latinas, Latina women, Latinas from the church, any Latina is very important, have a access and inclusion and be part of the of the table, right? Um, different table, like especially uh, the uh, cap, uh, uh, the CAP, the, the Ryan White uh, um, Committee, uh, Prevention Committee, um, is very important. Put our boys there. Fabulous, fabulous. And I, I just love the fact that um, you're working so hard within uh, your community to create this center for folks to find empowerment and to find support and to find their own voice. And I just think that that's um, remarkable. And, you know, um, I, I just want to make sure that um, you and, and, of course, Nishi and Don, like that, that all of the presenters, including the presenters to come, are okay with folks reaching out to them and, and asking questions about how do you make this work and, and how can I make this work in my area? Would you be okay with that, Ariana? Well, my agency, Ariana Center, not just uh, provide. Um, <clears throat> we we give training to different agencies. We are mm -hmm. um, partner with different agencies. Like example, right now we partner with Bliss, is one a local organization in Orlando. So they developing a program for transgender individuals. Like they want to, they, like the needs they want, right? They want to focus on prevention. So I help them for uh, different part. Uh, for everybody, and of course, I'm open to um, to have any type of, of consultation or any type of questions or emails to uh, the transgender community because it's very important uh, for the transgender community, especially in this uh, in this time on this administration when nobody feel welcome, you know, or you have like on on welcome place. Transgender community and Latina community that have that 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 have that feeling. We have that feeling for not just this administration, many administrations, mm -hmm. so many. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very important partner with the transgender because actually we are survivors and we know how survivor in, in the difficult in the difficulties or, 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 or when people they show you the hate. Fabulous. Well thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. 
So um, I'd like to introduce our next group of speakers from uh, Broward County Regional Planning Council. Um, Amy is not with us today, um, but I will provide a little background on Amy. Amy Newton currently works as the Quality Improvement Manager with the Broward Regional Health Planning Council, providing support and technical assistance to the Ryan White Part A grantees clinical quality management program. Amy received both her Master of Public Health and Bachelor of Health Science from the University of Florida, um, and she's passionate about improving access to health care, quality, um, quality health care, and reducing health disparities for underserved populations. Um, providing the presentation are two of uh, Amy's colleagues, um, Kelsey on the right and Charnel on the left in the picture here. Uh, Kelsey Holloman received her Master of Public Health from the Florida International University and is a certified health education specialist. She's experienced in program planning and evaluation, data analysis and reporting as it relates to quality improvement and grant writing. Kelsey began her public health career as a health planner, providing support to the Ryan White Part A grantees clinical quality management program in the Broward County EMA. As she continues her career as a health planner, she's eager to work to provide health quality, um, sorry, provide quality health care to HIV positive persons in Broward County. And Charnel Bacchus Powers is a public health professional with experience in quality management, health education, and program planning. Charnel was intrigued by the field of public health while working for the Florida Department of Health, and this experience encouraged her to pursue and receive her Master's of Public Health from Florida International University. Charnel was passionate about improving the health of those around her and became a certified health education specialist in 2014. In her current role as a clinical quality management health planner, she's continuing to pursue her passion through quality management, um, through quality improvement, within Broward County's Ryan White Part A Clinical Quality Management Program. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to you ladies to, to share a little bit what's happening in Broward County down in the south of Florida these days. Hi, good Hello. afternoon. Hello. Um, so we're going to be talking about a project that we did down here um, in our Ryan White Part A Program. We did it um, in our case management service category, so we used clients that were utilizing our case management services. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. So for this project, we did it on um, not our unsuppressed black uh, non-Hispanic women utilizing case management services in the Part A program. So they had a viral load greater than 200. Um, that's what our, our system considers being not virally suppressed. So to collect this data, we had our case managers do an in-depth in-depth assessment doing patient interviews and uh, chart reviews to identify barriers to care for black women um, in our system. So to do this, we used a modified version of a barriers to care scale. Um, it's a questionnaire. They typically, it typically has 12 uh, barriers listed, and we modified it to fit our population and to fit the needs for the data that we were looking to find. Um, we collected demographics, uh, comorbidities, socioeconomic status. We collected all of this data as well as getting uh, the reported barriers to care for each of the, the females that were in the, the project. Um, so we collected this data and our team analyzed it and, um, and we reported it back to our case managers and we're utilizing this information for our program. So on this slide, you can see the list of barriers that we had. We had 60 total uh, females that were in the project. So we used a spreadsheet um, that we actually got from a, a webinar that we saw on NQC. And the spreadsheet had the barriers listed and um, we modified it to fit our needs and to fit what would be easiest for our case managers to collect data with. Um, so this spreadsheet was an Excel that we had. We had the barriers listed and we had the clients listed on it for each case manager and for their clients at their agency. Um, and each, we had each uh, cell in the Excel had drop down menus that they could report if the barrier was a very slight problem, somewhat of a problem or a major problem. Um, so these drop-down menus really helped with data entry, avoiding data entry errors, and making sure we had consistent data from each of our case managers. So um, we sent this temp template out to our case managers that had the barriers that we wanted to, to collect information on, and they did the in-depth chart reviews to collect this information, or they did patient interviews if that was an option for 
uh, the client that they were collecting information for. So luckily for us, we do have our own management information system that our case managers are required to document a narrative about each encounter with their client. So even if it's as little as you called the client to get them to an appointment, you have to mark why they said they couldn't come or um, why they can come or how they're getting there. So for us, we do have narratives on each of our clients and it is required. So that was the best way for our case managers to collect this data, was to read chart reviews for the clients, for the females in the, um, in the study. Um, so if, if the, the case managers were able to see the client in person and collect this data that way, that was obviously a preferred method, but doing an in-depth chart review of the client was also pretty accurate considering they do document every encounter and, and every contact with the client. Um, yeah, so next slide, please. So this is overall just a glimpse of the data that we caught. It's a very simple version. So our top reported barrier was lack of personal financial, financial resources. 70% um, of the females in this project uh, documented that as being a barrier to care. Uh, so that's followed by lack of transportation to access services. That's a common, a common theme down here. Um, we do have the bus system, but it is, it is complicated and, and people see it as an inconvenience. So that is an issue that we deal with. Um, not taking meds, that was, we, whenever we tailored this project to really fit our needs, we wanted to put a big focus on viral load suppression. Um, we figure, you know, if our clients are virally suppressed, then they are probably in care. They're probably, um, they have good health outcomes. They're doing something right. And so we incorporated um, measures in there to see maybe why these, these females are not virally suppressed. So not taking their medications for forgetfulness, pill burden, um, just not wanting to take their medications around with them. That was a measure that we were really interested in, in, in getting when we were collecting this data. So we can kind of get insight on viral load suppression as well as barriers to care. Um, another one was lack of employment opportunities. Um, a lot of people down here say, or a lot of the females down here say that, you know, it's hard to get work. They have children, they need childcare, and, and it's almost impossible to have that opportunity to, to have a job. So, um, so more that lack of housing is another common top barrier. We have a lot of homeless people down here, and we do deal with that. I think it's a national problem. Housing is, is a really big issue. Um, so here you can see we have listed several of the barriers that were on the, the template that we used to collect barriers. Um, but we do have the top most reported and, and we use that information to, to really figure out how we can fix this problem. So for the next slide. So I wanted to give you guys some insight on the challenges that we faced whenever we did this study and and give recommendations on how to avoid those challenges. So if this is replicated, you can know to look out for these issues. Um, so a big issue is collecting data directly from the client. I know that it's very difficult for case managers to, to meet with a client and get this type of in-depth information. Um, my recommendation for that is to, to kind of do what we did and to figure out the best method to collect client information prior to beginning a project. So we were able to use chart reviews to do this, but we also do have our own management information system that we do have the ability to look in depth in the chart reviews that all providers will leave for that client if they are in, in our system. So we do have that unique quality about us, but for, for other um, EMAs or TGAs, it might would be easier for you, know, you to have a face-to-face -face with the client if you have less clients. We do have a large population down here and lots of clients. So face-to-face -face is just not the best method for us. So my recommendation for that is just to reflect on what your resources are and to know how your clients communicate. Know, 
if they do communicate by phone or if they don't answer the phone and, and determined if meeting in person or doing a phone interview or just doing a chart review is the best, me best method to collect data. Um, another issue is clients do not report, uh, self-report mental health issues. So mental health issues can be a huge barrier to care. And, um, um, but they, they're not likely to, to report this due to the stigma. And we know the stigma around mental health is, is huge and it is a problem. So for our case managers, we did ask them, like, how do you want to address the issue of mental health? How do you want to collect that data? And of course they say that, you know, they will rely on the client's medical history because if they do have a history of mental health problems, it is more than likely noted in the client's um, chart. But they said another way is that they do try to develop a, a basic personal comfort level with their clients and so their clients do feel comfortable enough telling them about their mental health issues and they are willing to be honest about it. Um, so the recommendation for that is to rely on the medical history if possible but also make sure whoever is collecting this information is, is comfortable with the client and the client is comfortable with them and, and really trusts them. Um, or else you're probably not going to get accurate information on mental health issues for the client. Um, and then another thing that, that was a big issue for us was the data collection tool that we used, the spreadsheet um, that we gave our, our case managers to collect the data on the clients. So we did have a couple of meetings where we did like a training of the spreadsheet and how to use it, but whenever we got the data back at the end, a lot of the, the directions that we gave them were not followed. And so we realized maybe they needed more of an in-depth training on how to use the data collection tool. And since then we do more, we do QIPs across all of our services and we do in-depth trainings on how to use our data collection tools. And so that was a really big lesson learned. And also designing the tool in a way that is really easy to use for your case managers or for whoever would be collecting data. Um, so my recommendation for that is to do an in-depth training on the data collection tool and we have found it to be very helpful to give a printout or a handout of step-by-step -step instructions on how to use the tool at the time of data entry. So whoever is sitting there collecting data on the spreadsheet, they can look at the list of, of steps to input the data. Um, and, and our case managers or other people that we have collecting data have found that really, really helpful. Um, so those are some issues that we had and recommendations that we have to, to solve those. The next slide, please. So moving forward past the Barriers to Care QIP, we entered the second phase, which was our intervention QIP. So we focused it also on the black female population um, that we focused on in the Barriers to Care QIP. Um, and we used interventions on a template that was similar to the Barriers to Care QIP, but in place of the barriers, it had um, interventions that case managers had input in helping to choose. So some of them were graphs and visuals, repetitive teaching, home visits, um, a lot of the um, ways that we could address the barriers. Um, so these interventions were tracked on this spreadsheet and it also had the client's viral load as well. So that was um, a measure for improvement um, or how we measured our improvement was tracking viral load along with the interventions that were used for each individual client. Um, so also what we did with the data from the Barriers to Care QIP was to figure out a way to further help black females um, in our county. So we're doing that by using MAI funding um, to help us to possibly implement a pilot care coordination program aimed at our target population of black women um, and hopefully it will help us eliminate more barriers and also improve viral load suppression. Um, and so we hope to do this by conducting focus groups with this population um, and that will help us to further tailor our program to um, help this population achieve our ultimate goal of viral load suppression and address all of the barriers to care, hopefully. Are there any questions? 
Fabulous. Well, I see that there are a couple in the chat room. So um, both Don and Nishi, um, earlier speakers, um, were emphasizing um, peer involvement. So um, I know that you're speaking from the Broward County EMA standpoint. Um, so I don't know if you could touch maybe um, does the um, County Department of Health, um, for the purpose of administrating the Part A grant, involve peers in any way in a consumer advisory committee or a consumer committee on the planning council? And then second, Secondly, um, are there opportunities for peers to be involved in funded programs? So do you fund peer involvement? And so I think that those are two different opportunities to involve peers, and I just wanted to make sure that, you know, um, we had a chance to hear from you on that. Yeah, we do actually, uh, some of our services do have funded peer, peer specialists, and we, we do have a peer program where where we do have uh, peers active in several of our service categories. Whenever we do um, studies like this, or this QIP, it was directly with our consumers, and it was between the case managers and the consumer. But in this case, since the, the peer specialist is, they're out in the agencies no matter what service, so maybe a peer specialist did help collect this data, um, and then, you know, going into where how, how we want to create a pilot program for the care coordination program using the MAI funding, um, whenever we do focus groups, we really do try to target those to not only our consumers, but to peers from anywhere in the county. So whenever we do these focus groups, it's, it's, we want to get more qualitative information on the information that we already collected from the Barriers to Care QIP so we can really know how to solve the problem, how to solve these barriers. And um, peers will definitely be involved in that. They'll be invited to come to these focus groups, and we really do look for their, um, their input. And I mean, as a Department of Health, I do know that they have peer specialists. We recently just incorporated these, the peer specialists into our program. And so that is something that's active. But at several of our agencies, we do have peer specialists there. And then also, whenever we do any focus groups or trainings, um, or even if it's a program that's outside of something that's directly targeted towards our consumers, we do try to involve people from the community. Um, we have a community empowerment committee. It's actually where Ariana is the, the chair for that. So we do have the, 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 the community's involvement and, and peer involvement. Beautiful. So I do see two more questions from other friends um, across the country, but um, looking at time, I definitely want to move forward to Allison. Um, so I think that one thing would be cool, maybe we can circle back to those other questions for, for um, Chanel and Kelsey? No problem. Beautiful. Thanks so much for your presentation and, um, yeah. and for that. So next I'd like to turn it over to um, Allison um, uh, Bogman. Uh, Allison is the program manager for the HRSA funded project using community health workers to improve linkage and retention in HIV care. For more than eight years, she's been engaged in public health research projects on a range of topics, including food insecurity, chronic homelessness, gender-based violence, and the needs of lesbian, gay, and bisexual cancer survivors. Her interests include um, effective framing and messaging for positive change in social and economic policy, effective data visualizations, and translating and dissemination, disseminating research findings to policymakers and the public. Allison received a Master of Public Health from Boston University School of Public Health in 2007. Currently, she's pursuing a PhD in public policy and public affairs at the McCormick Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. For her dissertation project, Allison is studying the impact of work requirements under 1996 welfare policy reform on the health of low-income single mothers. So I'm really excited to introduce Allison and to hear a little bit more about the Community Health Worker Project up in Boston. Allison? Thanks, Michael. Thanks so much for having me. Um, let me know if you have any trouble hearing me, um, if that's all right. Uh, loud um, and clear. Great. So um, the things that I've heard so far today have been so um, inspiring and interesting to me, and, and I'm hoping that what I have to share from this recent initiative that um, I'm a part of will um, sort of mesh with what's been shared so far. So as Michael said, the, this recent initiative that I'm a part of is called Com Using Community Health Workers to Improve Linkage and Retention in HIV Care. And this initiative um, 
is a three-year project um, that started uh, this year and runs through uh, 2019. It's funded by the Secretary of Health and Human Services Minority AIDS Initiative Fund and also through um, the HRSA HIV and AIDS Bureau Department of Community HIV AIDS Programs, or DCHAP. And uh, my organization here at Boston University um, was funded to be the technical assistance and evaluation center for this initiative. So we're funded to do um, several different things, but a couple, uh, a couple things that I want to highlight is that number one, uh, part of our funding is to develop and conduct webinars for HIV medical providers that are interested in uh, obtaining knowledge about developing community health worker programs or, um, work, or working to improve community health worker programs in their HIV um, medical services. Um, and the webinars will cover a range of topics um, beginning this summer. Uh, we'll have a few webinars at least presented each year. Um, one of the um, things that we're really interested in covering is sort of this history of community health workers and what's the, what is the difference between a community health worker and a peer um, in HIV care, which I'll hopefully touch on later if there's a little time, and also ways to integrate community health workers into the care team. Um, this is what I heard Dawn talking about earlier when she was talking about how she's working at her um, agency as a, a peer volunteer, and she really wants to get behind the counter. She wants to have access to you know, some patient um, information, like perhaps the electronic medical record. And uh, our, the perspective that we have on this initiative is that that kind of integration of community health workers is really key to um, them being um, successful in the agency and also having success with the clients that they're working with. So that's the first um, thing that I wanted to emphasize that's happening with initi this initiative. The others um, are that we are going to be producing um, three different products um, by the end of the initiative. The first is going to be an implementation guide for organizations and healthcare agencies, clinical settings that want to either improve um, their um, community health worker program of services or that maybe don't have um, any kind of person like this working in their setting and they want to start this kind of program. And this implementation guide is going to have everything from soup to nuts in it, you know, what to do if you're getting started, what kind of training you want to be thinking about, how you want to maybe go about the recruitment and hiring process, um, what um, kinds of supervision um, training you want to provide, and what are the sort of roles and skills and qualities that good community health workers have. We're also going to be um, developing and publishing two national training curriculum one specifically for community health workers in HIV care, and the other um, important also is for people that supervise community health workers. Uh, we find that supervising community health workers isn't, is a little bit different than supervising maybe other staff in the agency, like a front desk um, receptionist or um, other medical assistant staff, for example. And so there are some particular, um, particular skills and perspectives that we would like supervisors to have when they're um, going to be supervising um, a peer or a community health worker. Um, so I also wanted to just say a few words about why we're pursuing um, the community health worker model. And community health workers have been used for a long time um, in the U.S. starting on um, Native American reservations, and they are used today in a number of chronic um, health conditions, including HIV, although I think more widely known in HIV are um, our peers. Um, community health workers, um, to a lot of people, has become sort of an umbrella term that has underneath it a range of, you know, of job titles, even case managers sometimes, patient navigators, um, linkage specialists, 
peer navigators, um, a number, there are a number of different sort of job titles that can fall underneath this um, title of community health worker. Um, community health workers um, have been um, noticed because of their um, unique ability to help with the, the HIV continuum of care um, and the continuum of care in other chronic health conditions too. Um, I think one of the key pieces to this is the fact that community health workers um, are, um, are selected um, based on their connection to the community. So that is really the most, one of the most key things about um, a community health worker is how they're connected to the community. And that could be because um, of the community in which they live, it could be because they're a woman of color, it could be because they're a woman of color who's also living with HIV, it could be because they, um, the person has a um, shared life experience um, with substance abuse or homelessness or any number of, of factors. Um, so that's really um, one of the key elements that makes community health workers so good at what they do. And what they do, I think, really well are exactly the things that we've been hearing about today, especially that um, Kanisha and Dawn talked about. I heard them talk about, you know, people that gave, that allowed them to um, achieve a sense of empowerment um, by educating them. This is a um, key role of community health workers that they can play. Someone who connects um, to who you are as a person as you're receiving your primary care. Um, I think that um, in, um, in the healthcare workforce today, um, traditional healthcare workforce might not really be um, fully equipped to um, connect with people at this level and also to address other really, really critical factors that can be barriers to care that we've heard about today, social, economic, cultural, structural factors, um, like transportation, like housing, um, like uh, language, um, and other factors as well, um, like particular stigma issues or, and culture. Um, and um, this goes across um, the diverse uh, population that we've been talking about today, just within African and American and Latina women. Um, so community health workers may be a really, really effective way to address these um, larger barriers. Um, and ultimately, what we want to address um, are things that impact the continuum of care, including access to care, linkage to care, um, and retention in care. Um, these, there's a lot of interest in community health workers as well because they are uh, found to be extremely cost effective. So you get a, a huge bang for your buck um, using um, community health workers in healthcare settings. Um, we are, for this project, also going to be working with a few sites around the country to um, provide them with direct um, support and technical assistance around um, using community health workers in their clinical settings. And we're going to be um, looking at different outcomes um, at the client level, um, at the community health worker level, and also at the healthcare system level um, to really help determine um, what are the best ways to implement this kind of program in um, HIV, how, are, how is it, um, work out the best to integrate a community health worker into the care team, um, how, um, how does a community health worker work best um, to um, make sure that clients are linked to care, are retained in care, are very satisfied with their care, and that clients have this uh, feeling of empowerment and self-efficacy that, that they are in, um, they have control over what happens to them and they have support to help them get to where it is they want to go. Um, I guess the last thing, if I have a minute more to share, is that um, I will type in the, the website for our project if you want to learn more about it. 
Um, as I said, like, it would be really great um, to keep an eye out for the webinars that we're going to be offering um, on the national level. We're going to be working with the Target Center um, in the Ryan White community to advertise and promote these. And um, we're also launching um, a, a national library of resources on our website uh, for um, resources around community health workers. Um, in, in chronic health conditions and also particularly in HIV care. So we're going to be curating all the toolkits and uh, papers and um, other information that we can find and house them in this national library. So um, thanks very much for, for letting me speak a little bit and I'd love to um, try to answer any questions if people have them. Great, thanks so much, Allison. Um, one thing that I'd like to ask right off the bat is you're putting together this great um, resource library on your website, and would you mind if we point to your website from our website? Sure, yes. Fabulous, collaboration in the works here. Yes, that's great. <laughs> And I see, um, you know, quite a bit of comments from Donna Nishi in the chat room about um, the importance of um, community health workers and, and thinking in this way. I don't know if Donna Nishi, if you had any comments that you wanted to kind of make out in, in the open or if anyone else has any comments that they'd like to make. Hi, this is Nishi. I was just, uh, kudos, Allison, great work. Um, but yes, the community health worker standpoint is so still needed, and that's what brought me through um, my struggles in 1997 because it was more hands-on. It was stage-based encounters being diffused where you were. So you can have that talking um, capacity building with the individual right in front of you. Mm -hmm. Yes. I know, this is Don. I know when I began working here at Evergreen, uh, within my first three months, we actually had to take a community health worker training. It was for three days, uh, and it was awesome. And it 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 brought what actually our jobs were, uh, and it was a room full of everybody that did different job titles: care coordinators, uh, supervisors. Uh, I at that time was just a peer. Um, but we were all in a room together, and again, as I stated, you know, we were in this community health worker training, and we, again, like I said, it, it, these are great workers, and we are all at some level community health workers. You know, we're all trying to get the same thing, so this is an awesome, uh, awesome thing that, that your project is doing, I think. Now, I saw some questions from Anayam Iqbal as well. I'm going to go ahead and unmute Anayam. Um, and I'm wondering, it, it's nice the way that the way that these presentations are coming together, we're talking a lot about um, needs and solutions and, and possibilities. And I feel as though the questions that you had, though your questions were for um, our friends in Broward County, um, they're also, you know, kind of skirting across the surface of Allison's presentation and also comments that were made by um, uh, Nishi and, um, and Dawn. So I'm wondering, um, and I, if you wanted to just kind of, um, I unmuted you if you want to ask your question or, or if um, there's anything else you wanted to add. And I don't know if you're too far from the phone um, there. I, I, we can't hear you very well. Or perhaps we're having um, um, a technical difficulty, and I'm um, sorry about that. Michael, um, I a question. This is Nishi. I missed the question. Her question was, um, how did you address um, barriers such as lack of employment, community stigma, and not taking meds? Um, and um, this is where I thought that the overlap was. Who communicated the solution to barriers with clients who are not connected? Or, um, wait, sorry. Who communicated the solution to barriers with the clients who are connected to social support staff and who are not connected to social support staff? Who communicates that? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so, so this was a question that was directed to um, to Kelsey and Chanel, but I thought also kind of dovetails nicely with um, comments about community health workers um, that Allison made and also, you know, the peer emphasis that you and Dawn had made. Okay, so from St. Louis, uh, this is Nishi Parkins again. Uh, our connection comes from our Lincoln Secure team. Uh, the Lincoln Secure team actually uh, provides the information from their hub 
where an individual calls in for um, services because they have been, they probably have been out of care for 13 months or greater, or they may be newly diagnosed and just doesn't know where to uh, start. They may have got that diagnosis at a, a hospital or at an a opening testing site somewhere in the community, and then they're linked to care. Once they're linked to care, they're linked to a case manager, and that case manager um, is diffused to the ground, or they can set up a meeting um, with the case manager to do open enrollment packet paperwork. Once that open enrollment packet paperwork happens, then the case manager will let them know that they have a peer or a health coach on the team, a woman or man living with HIV, and would they be interested in uh, coming on board with the peer or allow the peer to talk with them at some point in time throughout their treatment process. Um, and then we, book, we will build a relationship over a period of time with the person if they opt in and say yes, it's voluntary. Um, but if we see a need there where the person is really, really struggling and can benefit from a peer, we know that the peer model works well. Great. Thanks so much, Nishi. And I don't know, um, um, if anyone else on the presentation um, panel wants to respond to that. Um, I can. I can tell you some of the interventions that, that, we, um, that we came up with to address those barriers that were identified. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so, for example, for lack of financial resources, we did some research on interventions, and actually through NQC we did find another resource with interventions to address the top barriers that are barriers to care. So for financial, uh, lack of financial resources, we, um, we have budget counseling. And so our case managers actually do the budget counseling. We also did um, referrals to job trainings, and we also try to do research on job fairs that we try to, um, to, to put out there and get our case man or make sure our case managers know about them to tell the clients. So those were two interventions that that we are currently using now to address that specific barrier. Um, for mental health issues, we do have, for that barrier, we do referrals to our mental health services and just really make sure that those referrals are being followed up with. Um, I'm not sure. So for not taking meds, we actually have a few ones that we do for that. For the, we do graphs and visuals, which we actually have the case managers kind of maybe even just an example, like show the client's viral load history on a graph, even if it's on a piece of paper if they drew it out, and, and make a little graph that would show the increase or decrease in their viral load and kind of explain how, how that correlates to their health. And because and, a lot of the clients don't even know exactly what the viral load means. So that's just one example of like graphs and visuals. We also have pill boxes that we have the case managers distribute to their clients to help them remember when to take their pills and to see if they have or have not for that day. Um, and then we do also have a text message system that makes sure that we'll directly text or phone call, whichever the, or email, whichever the client prefers. Um, medication, uh, or like pharmacy reminders, appointment reminders, um, and then some of our case managers even have a relationship that's, you know, close with their clients so they can text them and, and try to remind them to, you know, take your medicine if they know that it's a client that's really struggling with something such as that. Um, so those are just the few interventions that we have implemented. And, and we really did some research to, on what has been done in the past to see if that would be successful for us. Hello. This is Ariana. Um, um, Hi. I want to yes. I just want to talk. Uh, what is the um, linkage to care for my um, community? Um, my agency may, um, especially right now, we uh, have a grantee for um, a grant for main change process. This is the first uh, encounter, and we use the main change process to uh, linkage or or or, or back in care to a uh, um, a general. When we think about transgender living with HIV, but in a living HIV, our case manager is very unique. Um, we are uh, working like in this period, we try to put the transgender in, in the text of the Bible. Um, two is to people who 
go to get a, a medication until the gender or the transgender, they have the name change and say, okay, now you feel comfortable, you can go and pick it up your medication, and also by education, right? What they gave me was uh, in the beginning was a peer, but for be a peer, I was be a, a participant for um, 18 classes of the Cheers a Peer program over here in Fort Lauderdale, where it's no more. Uh, on, on, I'm sorry, in Orlando, but it's no more. But I try to implement the same uh, series of, of, of educate peers uh, in, in Broward, but actually we don't have um, we don't have a uh, um, um, Great uh, funding resources, especially for 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 the state level. But also, I think uh, this is the, the some programs they have to uh, take management, specific for uh, unique communities like transgender communities, right? A specific uh, a specific linkage and care and, and pro programs they working for those communities for them. Thanks so much for that. Thanks so much for that. Um, so I know that there um, are a number of questions um, still remaining, um, so I'm going to stay on the line. Um, I hope that um, our, our presenters can stay, but we understand if you can't, and we hope that many of you can stay online as well. We know that we had a set end time for 2.30 today, but the conversation is very important. Um, and I feel that the next question um, from uh, Ms. Dolores Dockery, um, another one of my friends and colleagues here at the National Equality Center, is, is really important too. And um, Ms. Dolores, I unmuted your line so that you can ask it, um, you know, so that everyone can kind of hear and process that I think it's a really important question that you had. I hope you can hear me. Yes, ma'am. Um, this presentation was really great, packed with a lot of information. But, but, but I know that the issue for women um, accessing health care or their efforts to get to barrel load suppression is impacted by many of the intersecting issues in their lives, and some of them you've mentioned. I heard you talked about homelessness and unemployment and lack of funds, and I heard you also talk about um, uh, 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 I think the issue that I didn't hear about was how violence impacts a women's uh, ability to access health care and to reach viral load suppression. And I wondered, as you look at the many barriers impacting the lives of women, mm -hmm. uh, kind of what are the things that are being done where you are in your area to address some of these barriers? Um, <laughs> we, it's kind of difficult to answer because we do work more on a system level. We work directly with our providers and we, we have our providers communicate with our consumers, and we do do things in the community. Um, but one thing that I do hear often, we have a huge Haitian community here, and weekly our case managers tell us a lot of their Haitian client, or Haitian women clients, um, they, they do experience a lot of violence, or they, their husbands have to make call the shots, and if they go to appointments, their husband has to be there, and they can't really speak for themselves. And the way that our case managers are addressing that is they really do the empowerment, and they try to, if, if they get the feeling that, you know, the wife feels as if she can't go to her appointments alone, or she isn't smart enough to figure out the bus system to get to her appointments, they, they really do try to help in that situation. For example, um, we had one case manager last week present a case study and her client uh, was Haitian and the husband was very uh, just con in control and she didn't feel as if she could go to these appointments alone or navigate the bus system. So our case manager said that she took a day out of her schedule to meet at the client's house and help the client get to the bus and then ride on the bus with the client to get to the appointments that she would go to that day. And that was kind of just an empowerment thing for her, was showing the client that she could do that and, and do it on her own, and she helped her navigate it. So from what we hear, it is really hard to hear about what's going on in the community, and I know there's several events that go on about uh, violence against women. We see 
we see flyers for that stuff all the time. And unfortunately, we do really work on a system level, and that makes it difficult. But I know that our case managers experience these issues, and I know that they really do try to take a personal steps to help, to, to empower the women, just to make sure that they know they can do it on their own. And I know if our case managers suspect any, any type of violence, they do try to get um, the women in a safe space if they need housing or um, they can call at any time. I mean, they, they really try to, to address that if they do sense that that is going on in one of their clients' lives. Um, but besides that, it's, it's difficult to say on a, on a huge level what we are doing to directly address uh, violence. But I think it's a really, really good idea and it's something that we will definitely think about now since maybe we haven't thought about it um, enough. So thanks for, for pointing that out. Thank you. Would any of the other speakers like to address, you know, violence against women as a particular barrier um, or, or w what suggestions or solutions you have? Um, it's a shame that Ariana had to leave us because I know that violence against trans women is an incredibly big problem. Um, so I, I'm wondering maybe she'll be able to provide a little bit afterwards so for us to include in handouts. But any other speaker want to handle that, um, you know, violence against women? Um, um, I in St. Louis, um, I attempt to uh, have conversations with uh, women over a period of time to, you know, find out if they're involved with a partner or several partners because um, it could get murky if they do not uh, disclose their status. Um, and I, I also talk with the women to let them know that disclosure could be done in a way that you can educate an individual so that you will not put yourself in trouble for not telling your status. And a lot of different states do a lot of different things for us, the laws and the policies and things like um, signing documentation saying that you know that you're supposed to tell your status. And we have this big old array of information for us, HIV and criminalization and things like that. So I really try to encourage the women to have, um, you know, a plethora of conversations over a period of time, even when you're just at that dating stage and you're on the phone and you're texting back and forth, you kind of really need to see the mindset of the gentleman or the woman that you're dealing with at that time. Because it, it, it is a, a sensitive to topic to talk about for most people, um, not knowing that they will be rejected or if they will be rejected. Um, if I'm going to wake up and all of my windows are going to be broken out of my car window, you know, it's just a lot of risk. Um, that you take when you open yourself up to talking about um, realistic things that are happening because two event, two people or two individuals are having consensual sex over a period of time. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think it's, I would say, um, I think a lot of people are aware of this, but I think it's also key for um, healthcare uh, providers and agencies to to know about community resources, um, to help uh, people who have been um, the victims of violence. Um, and it's also important when dealing with, um, you know, um, men who have sex with men to deal with violence. Um, so it's important, I think, just to be able to know what the community resources are, have strong connections, whether they're formal connections or informal connections to things like um, shelters, to things like um, rape crisis centers, things like um, other um, violence prevention and um, other community organizations that specialize in this. I think that, you know, all of these factors are bigger than the healthcare system. And so, you know, the healthcare system more and more needs to be connected as much as possible with the community in order to address these things that really impact um, people's lives and their health. Yeah, I agree. Great. 
Well, thanks so much, everyone, for um, joining us today. I really appreciate the dialogue that we've been able to create together around this issue. And, you know, as I mentioned, this is an entire month focused on African-American and Latina women. Next week on Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern, we'll have a Partners in Care discussion, which is really focusing on the consumer end um, of the question and um, what we can do um, as women living with HIV to help each other um, and, um, you know, how we can become more involved in, in um, the services system and, and, and tackling these issues. Um, and then um, the last Friday of the month, um, March 31st, we have an office hours um, where we're going to be exploring the comprehensive health needs of women um, living with HIV, African American Latina women living with HIV. And it gets at a lot of these questions that we started picking at today on today's call. And of course, many of us already recognize that, you know, women have a lot of needs in their life and health might be somewhere lower on the priority, um, you know, scale than, than taking care of of kids or development or growth, um, you know, feeding yourself. There's many different things sometimes that can be a competing need. So that last office hours of the month, um, um, March 31st at 1 p.m. Eastern, we're going to be focusing on comprehensive needs. Um, and I believe um, a number of the folks on today's call are going to be um, helping us to facilitate and guide that conversation as, as we work our way uh, through that. So again, um, Thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate and value your participation. Um, the slides, the recording, and then um, the uh, handouts um, for today's conversation will be posted on the website before the end of the day. So again, thanks for all you do and hope to see you again very soon. Have a wonderful day, everyone. You too. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.